Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. We are coming to you here again virtually through, our, through the means of YouTube technology. Thank the Lord for that. Uh, the good news is next Sunday, we are resuming services here. That's January 3rd. We're going to resume services in the sanctuary here, a freshly sanitized sanctuary with distance seating and all of that good stuff. We're going to one service. It'll be at 10 a.m. So if you show up at 9 a.m., you'll be very early. If you show up at 11, you'll be very late. So 10 o'clock is the new start time. Today, you might be surprised to see me up here today. And in all honesty, I'm a little bit surprised to see myself here today also. Um, I had a, the Lord put it on my heart about a week and a half ago to send a communication out to the church uh, with a message of hope for 2020, for 2021 actually. And I wrote up a, a, an email and I wanted to run it by Pastor today to get his feedback. And his feedback was, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful message, but I think you should present it as a sermon rather than an email. So I prayed about it, talked it over with my wife, and we both felt it was okay to come here and, and record this and, and uh, share it with you folks. I don't get up here a lot to speak to you people, and uh, so when I do, I usually have a lot to say. So if I run a little bit long today, please forgive me. The, the good thing behind it is you have technology to hit the pause button if you need to step out for a second, but come back because the end is going to be uh, your message of hope for 2021. So as we start this, let's pray and then we'll get started. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to be here, to, to be able to speak to the congregation here, the message that you put on my heart over the last week or so, and I pray that I do it justice. I pray that people walk away from here encouraged and hopeful for 2021. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to give you a message of hope for 2021. <clears throat> 2020 was a rough year, but so before we go into 2021, I want to do a quick year in review of 2020. And as many of you know, it was a very rough year. And I think there's going to be a lot of people who look at 2020 as a year of doom, a year where the words COVID and corruption reigned through this whole year, it seems. Uh, we ran into a lot of issues with COVID, but started back in March, and it um, kind of um, occupied everybody's thought process for the entire year. And then as the election approached, we ran into a whole lot of corruption that we saw in, in the leadership of this country and, and beyond. And uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of that first, and then we're going to get into the message of hope. So 2020, I think we're going to look at a year as, as COVID and corruption. I think we're also going to look at it as a year where we never want to go back to. It's one of those years that we just want to erase from our memories and never go back to this year again because it was just so bad for so many people. We're going to look at 2020 as a year where we all started walking around like Mort from the Bazooka Joe comic strip. You know, this guy, I remember him from 40, 45 years ago when I was a little kid and getting the Bazooka Joe uh, comic strips from the candy, from the gum, and saying, wow, this guy looks like a, a moron <laughs> walking around with his uh, turtleneck over his face. But he was a true visionary, you know? We're all walking around like this right now, unfortunately. 2020 is a year we're going to look at as a year that we had to get creative. You know, basic services like getting a haircut uh, we weren't able to, to experience anymore for, for a while there. And people either didn't cut their hair or they cut their own hair or they got creative and got their hair cut like this. 2020 is a year where we're going to look at and say where we scored some hand sanitizer. It was like winning a trophy. And uh, I think that applies to toilet paper for a while there. And um, Lysol uh, probably fits that category. And from what I understand, you still can't find a can of Lysol anywhere. Uh, and if you can, it's like $35 on Amazon or something like that. 2020 is a year that we're going to look at where everyone became like Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. Everybody became a germaphobe, and everybody's afraid of germs, and people can't touch things, and uh, everybody's afraid to be near each other and all of that. And, and I think that's a, a mentality that's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, you know, I was, I was at a doctor's appointment the other day, and uh, a woman dropped something, and there was another girl walking behind her, and she said, uh, Miss, you dropped something. I don't want to pick it up because I don't want to offend you. And I think that's kind of where we're heading with this whole 
COVID uh, germaphobe thing. But at 2020, you know, I think what happens is we, we look at um, a way of dealing with situations like 2020, where tragedy strikes and things like that. And I think that people deal with it in a number of ways. And one of the ways that people deal with it is they bring humor into it. I think it's a coping mechanism. I know my family, we do that all the time. You'll find us on, even laughing at funerals sometimes. And, uh, you know, humor is something that my father passed down to, to us, and we are, we're able to find something funny in even the gloomiest, gloomiest of situations. So I found these pictures on the internet I thought I'd share with you, and we had comparisons. If, if 2020 was a boat, it would look like this. It would be underwater. Uh, there's, there's a... Uh, title of the boat, the name of the boat is called No Worries, but I think this guy has something to worry about and at least uh, something to deal with after the fact. And if 2020 was a car, it would look like this. It would be all banged up and taped together. And if 2020 was on a playground and it was a slide, it would look like this here, where this kid's on a cheese grater. At the top, it's perfectly fine, but when he comes down, look out. And if 2020 was a pizza, it would look something like this, with fried eggs and beans on it. And uh, if you know me at all, you would not mess with my pizza or try to serve me that. that. That is not something that I see as appetizing. And if 2020 was a person, it would look like this. There's, whoop, sorry. There's a little bit of um, Adolf Hitler in there, a little bit of Michael Jackson, maybe some... Frankenstein monster, I'm not sure. Little Nancy Pelosi, maybe, I don't know. But that's what people, you know, would see as if this was a if this was a person. And if 2020 was a math problem, it would look like this. If you're walking on the ice cream at five ounces per toaster and your bicycle loses a sock, how much gravy will you need to repaint your hamster? You see, that doesn't make any sense. That's inconsistent. And I think what happens with humor is there's a little red flag that goes off in our head, and it says, hey, that doesn't make sense. That's that just not consistent with what's being asked there. And that red flag goes off, and sometimes we find that funny. But I think what happened in 2020 is that we saw a lot of inconsistencies in the way things were handled on many levels. And we're going to talk about some of those inconsistencies right now. And those inconsistencies caused people to have a lot of grief, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, anxiety, and, and angst through the whole year. You know, I, I witnessed Facebook posts where people are just ranting and they have all the solutions and they're going to fix everything with, what, with their solution. And I see anger, and, and that's the biggest thing I see out of it. And it's even from people in this church. And I'm watching you folks. I see your posts. So some of these inconsistencies we're going to look at today are, for example, if you're going to fly on an airplane, when you're in the airport, you have to sit at least one seat apart with a little cardboard sign between you to stay safe from the virus. But once you're on the plane, you could sit right next to each other, canned in like sardines. That's inconsistent, and I think that type of thing causes people frustration. Eating out, dining in a restaurant. It says here, as long as the inside is outside, then the eating inside is outside. So what they're saying here is you're not allowed to eat in a building, but if you build a building outside the building, it's okay to eat there. And that caused people a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress this year. Some of the rules that were implemented on us just didn't make sense. We look at this, I believe this was from Connecticut a few months ago. It says, new rules for restaurants, bars, and gatherings. Bars and restaurants with a state liquor license must close at 10 p.m. You see, that's inconsistent right there to me. That jumps out as a red flag. Because if you don't have a liquor license, you could stay open as long as you want, that tells me. And the virus is not threatening to some place that does not have a liquor license. And the other part of that is you must close at 10 p.m. because the virus rears its ugly head at 10 p.m., but at 9.59, you're perfectly safe. That's inconsistent. That doesn't make sense to me. Gyms, not like I go to one, but gyms must close at 10 p.m. Again, the, the virus 
is going to be harmful after 10 p.m. at a gym, but at 5, 6, 7 o'clock, it's not. That doesn't make sense. And the other thing that doesn't make sense is at 10 p.m., I'm thinking the gym is probably less crowded than it is at 5, 6, or 7 p.m. So that doesn't make sense. And that causes a lot of people some feelings to be to, to surface. And then I think this one really hits home because it is hitting home. Uh, indoor gatherings at private residences. People got upset over this because now you're coming into my house and telling me what I can do in my own house and what I can't do in my own house. And they're saying it's limited to 10 people. Well, that's great. Are you telling me that the 11th person is going to cause everybody to get COVID? Well, what if the first, one of the first 10 people have the virus? Just because the number is 10, well, why isn't it 8 or 6 or 12? It's just an arbitrary number that they picked out because it's a round number, an even number. And the statewide rules take effect Friday at 10 p.m. because Thursday at 10 p.m. the virus isn't dangerous yet. That's the way I'm reading these rules. Further inconsistencies. You see the lines on this map? They're imaginary. They don't really exist. They're virtual lines. Now, I travel a lot, or at least I used to, and I, and I would drive through New York or up into New Hampshire, and I didn't know that I was in another state until I saw a sign that says, welcome to New York or welcome to New Hampshire. So these lines don't exist. There's no physical barrier stopping a virus from going across it. And this kind of hits home for me because I'm under a doctor's care right now, and my doctor is very good at what he does. I love my doctor, but his advice for me for travel for the holidays was don't do it because I'm afraid if you go to New Hampshire to be with your family, you, go, you have a higher risk of, of getting um, COVID. So my thinking in that was, okay, so if I cross this imaginary barrier into another state that I have a higher risk to spend time with my family, I have a higher risk of getting COVID than if I don't cross an imaginary barrier and go to my family's house in Hazlitt, say, for example, and they have children, so the risk is lower there in New Jersey, which doesn't make sense because the numbers are much higher in Jersey anyway. So this, this doesn't make sense, and it caused some anxiety in me uh, through the holidays that I didn't travel. It wasn't on his advice. It was for other reasons, but, but uh, certainly was part of the thought process. And further inconsistencies surrounding politics, and I won't spend much time on this, but you know, we see this, this sign here, it says, those who spent the last four years convinced there was election interference are now saying there's no way an election could be rigged. That's inconsistent. That caused a lot of people to put a lot of posts out there on Facebook. Yes, a lot of posts, I'm watching you folks. And speaking of politics and the election, you know, one of our basic freedoms was taken away from us this year where we could not go to the polls and stand in line and make sure we flicked the switch for our candidate, no matter who it was. And, you know, we got a little upset over that because we saw, we saw things like this, where Home Depot had lines around the corner and it was safe to stand in a Home Depot line or a Walmart line or a DMV line, but it wasn't safe to stand and cast your vote. That's inconsistent. That caused people to get upset. Now, how people deal with these inconsistencies, uh, one of them is humor. I already talked about that. But another way people dealt with these inconsistencies in 2020 was finding hope in alcohol. This statistic goes back to March 13th, which was kind of the beginning of, of the um, pandemic uh, lockdowns, we'll call it, right around March 13th. And we see just this astronomical rise in, in alcohol sales. So um, some people dealt with this by saying, you know, let's eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we, we may die, you know? And, uh, and, and alcohol sales went through the roof. Another way people found hope in, in 2020 or are finding hope at this point is this vaccine that's, that's actually coming out right now or has come out in the last couple of weeks. They're finding hope that, you know, this vaccine is they're going to put some chemical or drug into their body and it's going to fix everything, that everything's going to go back to normal if everybody takes this needle. Well, there's no real clinical trials in this. Uh, it's, it's out for a very short time. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of anxiety over whether to take this uh, this inoculation or not. And quite frankly, I don't find hope in this at this point. 
The next thing people find hope in is a millimeter thick piece of fabric that was made in China, which is subsequently is the same place that the virus was manufactured in China. And people are putting hope in the fact that this little coffee filter is going to stop the virus from spreading all over this country. I don't find much hope in this. And, and I wear a mask uh, mostly for other people's requests. My doctor wants me to wear it. My wife wants me to wear it. Um, you know, and I wear it to make other people comfortable. Uh, you know, you're in a big setting. People want to feel comfortable. So I wear it because I look out for the, uh, the welfare of others above myself. I'd rather not wear them, but I do. Um, but I don't put really any hope in it. And people find hope in a man. People find hope in our president. And people are hoping that this president will be around for another four years and that everything's going to be okay if this guy's around. Well, if we're talking about political leaders, we'll look at our government leaders here, and this is what they've been telling us all year. They've been telling us that if we lock, our, lock down for two weeks, the virus will go away. Well, they told us this back in March, and we're here now in December, the end of December, and this virus is, the numbers are going up. It doesn't make sense. We're also told that if, that a stimulus package will be out next week. Well, I think they actually did a pretty good job on the first stimulus package. They got it out pretty quickly. And, um, you know, then they, then they talked about another one. And I don't think we've seen another one since. There was some unemployment increase for, for a short time. But I think back in August they started talking about this one, and they're still fighting over it. And we're at the end of December here. So I put no hope in that and my government officials for that. Well, again, we're told to wear a mask to eradicate the virus. Well, again, the numbers are going up. And most recently, I saw this uh, quick article about a new strain of this virus, some kind of mutated version of this virus coming out where it's stronger than ever. And, you know, my first thought is, wow, this happened right around the holidays when they were trying to lock down travel during the holidays, and all of a sudden this virus appears out of nowhere. But that's just me. And again, limit fa family gatherings and you'll be safe. We were told that. And again, the virus numbers are higher than ever. We're, we're told, we see in Ecclesiastes, the author of Ecclesiastes spends 12 chapters talking about the vanity of trying to find hope in man or on an earthly plane. And repeatedly, a number of times he says, all is vanity and grasping at the wind, which means it's unattainable. He talks about, about how we can find hope here, within ourselves, within the fellow man. And he's saying, you can't. It's, it's unattainable. You can't, you're grasping at the wind. It doesn't exist. And I tend to agree with him. So, I want to take a look at what's happening in the world right now, especially our country. Now, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not going to pretend to be. But this is what I see as some possibilities of what's happening in this country and what may happen in this country very, very soon. The first thing is, we, we, I'm, I believe we're witnessing the fall of America, potentially. We've seen a rigged election. We see foreign influence in our government and payoffs and bribes and all of that. And we see media propaganda running rampant. You know, uh, we're told one side of the story, it seems, but we're very rarely told the truth through the media. I see basic freedoms being taken away, and they're being taken away through these inconsistent rules that are being set upon us. And I find no hope in this, in, fi in getting these freedoms back. I see rioters having more rights than law-abiding citizens. You know, we, we see news reports of rioters showing up at somebody's house, ready to burn them down and tear them out and take over their property. But if you come out with a, a weapon, a gun, and you want to defend your property, you're the one that's going to jail. The rioters are getting set free or not even being arrested. That's inconsistent. Speaking of guns, I see our Second Amendment rights being threatened. You know, the government officials are talking about taking guns out of, our pro out of our possession. Well, the thing is, if you want to take our basic freedoms away, one of the things you need to do is take our guns away because then you won't be able to fight for your basic freedoms. And I see government leaders trying to take food out of our mouths to give it to illegal aliens, food, money, and health insurance, things like that. Things that we take for granted, basic necessities in our lives that are just coming out of our money and being given to illegal aliens. And they, they try to pass these people off as undocumented 
citizens. Well, they're not citizens. Otherwise, we'd call them citizens. They're aliens. They're illegals. They did something illegal to come into this country, and they're being rewarded for it. And it just doesn't make sense, and it causes a lot of grief in people. And I also see the opportunity for prosperity in this country disappearing. I don't see it coming back. You know, um, my wife and I kind of kid around, and we fantasize sometimes about, you know, retiring and maybe moving up to New Hampshire and getting a little roadside uh, food truck or something like that. There's no way I would open a business in this country right now. I don't see any hope for the small businessman. I, I, I actually believe that the government is trying to, to uh, have these businesses fail for whatever reason. So I would find no hope in that, and I, I, don't, I don't trust it. I also see my vote not counting anymore. I will continue to vote, but based on this last election, I firmly believe that the vote that I cast didn't really amount to much. And there's the opportunity for corruption that we see, and hopefully that'll be cleaned up for the next election, but I don't see any hope in that. So the question I have to ask you Bible-believing folks is, are you surprised by this? Now, the scripture repeatedly talks about things getting worse. And we see here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, when Paul writes his final letter, and he, and he, and he writes it to Timothy, uh, he's, he's given warning about what's coming up. And he says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth. So Tim, uh, Paul is telling Timothy, and he's telling us through the scriptures, that things are going to get worse until the day of Jesus Christ. They're not going to get better. You know, we talk about the good old days, right? We look back on when we were younger and we were kids and we talk about the good old days. Well, they were, they were better because as time is progressing, things are getting worse. This world is getting more chaotic. So the question is, where do you place your hope? You know, most people place their hope in a very strange place. They place their hope in next year. People say, I can't wait for this year to be over. I pray that next year is better. Well, according to the scriptures, it's not going to be. And when people place their hope in the next year, that's another one of those imaginary boundaries that I talked about, right? We talked about the map with these imaginary borders. Well, new year, a new year is simply an imaginary t uh, border in our timeline. We're going from December 31st to January 1st, and there's really nothing changing except where we have this imaginary reset in our brain that things are going to be different. We have the opportunity for a fresh start, when in reality, it's just a continuation of time. We're trying to fool ourselves. We have a hope by fooling ourselves. So... I think you know where I'm going with this. We're a Christian church here. We believe in the Bible. We believe what the Bible tells us. And obviously our hope lies in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. So my question is this, is what if 2021 is no better than 2020? What if 2021 gets even worse than 2020? What if some of these things I'm talking about really come true? What if the politicians do steal all of your personal freedoms and they steal all your personal belongings and possessions? What if they do give them uh, all to, your, to illegal aliens? What if communism does prevail in this country, which is the way it looks like it's heading? At least some people want it to. Many people want it to. What if they actually close these interstate borders and do put up physical barriers and people with guns like in a communist nation's? Now, I may be a little far-fetched here. I may be getting a little bit, you know, ahead of myself and, and a little a little um, exaggerated here, but maybe not. Let's bring it down a little bit. What if you can't find toilet paper again? What if there's a mad rush on it and, you, and, and we have that same situation that we did last year? What if you lose your job? 
What if in 2020 you lose your job? Would that make 2021 a better year than 2020? What if you lose a family member? Someone very close to you passes away. Is that going to make 21, 2021 better? What if you get a terminal disease? What if a doctor tells you we don't have a cure for what you, what you have right now? We don't know how long you're going to be alive. Where are you going to find hope? Again, we find our hope in Jesus Christ here at this church, I hope. And we need to treat Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And as I was preparing this message, it really came to me that Jesus plays two roles in our life, in our lives. And it's Lord and Savior. And I see that thrown a lot, around a lot. You know, he's my Lord and Savior. And, you know, it, what really came to me is that Jesus is the Savior of our souls, yes. There are people who believe in Jesus Christ, and he will save their souls when they die. And there's people who reject Jesus, and they're not going to end up in the presence of God in heaven. And that's a whole other sermon. But Jesus is our Savior of our souls when we die. But he is Lord, and he needs to be Lord when we're alive. And that really resonated with me this week. And I can't believe that it took me this long to, to realize that. But the Lord spoke that to me this week. And what that means about being Lord when we're alive is that we need to uh, treat him as our boss. We need to understand that everything that the Lord Jesus tells us, we need to believe and we need to obey. And what he tells us is written down in his scriptures. You know, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's one God their trinity, our little minds can't wrap, our, wrap ourselves around that, but, but that's how it exists. But they're the same person, but they're slightly different, and I don't understand all of that. But the way it came to me is that the Bible was written by Jesus, for Jesus, about Jesus, and about our relationship with Jesus, how he wants us to interact with him. And the scripture is full of commands that sometimes we misinterpret as suggestions, well, they're not. They're commands. And we're going to go over some of those in a little bit. So we see that Jesus is our hope. And there's many scriptures that talk about that. And I'm just going to give you a few as an example. 1 John 3.3 3 says, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And 1 Peter 1.3 it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And in uh, Titus chapter 2, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, it says that the God of salvation bring, uh, brings salvation to all men. It appears to all men, but some men reject it unfortunately. Continuing uh, very quickly, Ephesians talks about hope. It says that you may know what is the hope of his calling, Ephesians 1.18. And uh, Colossians says, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. And in 1 Timothy, uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our hope. And finally, in um, Colossians chapter 1 again, it says, To them God be willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which, Christ, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Christ resides in us, in his Holy Spirit, as his Holy Spirit. And we have that accessible to us. That's the hope that we need to hold on to. But... What, what I find uh, interesting and I find with a lot of Christians is they'll say they believe all of this and they say that Jesus is their Lord and Savior and they'll say that they trust the Lord and all of that, but they have this, this barrier, this problem of really tapping into the power of Jesus Christ, tapping into the Holy Spirit that lives within them. And they, and they live in, in these lives and they, they look at themselves and say, I'm not worthy. I'm not, I'm not doing what Jesus wants me to do. Well, first of all, you're not worthy. Um, but you're not doing the things that Jesus Christ wants you to do because maybe you're not accessing him 
uh, in a powerful enough way. Maybe, maybe you're a little confused about what the scriptures are saying or something like that. But I'm going to give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to tap into the power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit that lives in you. And, one, and the first thing we need to do is we need to believe what the New Testament epistle writers tell us. The first thing is we, we look at uh, Paul, we look at John, we look at Peter, and we look at the author of Hebrews, and all of them call Jesus their hope. The only New Testament epistle that doesn't is James, and James is the half-brother of Jesus who didn't believe Jesus until his resurrection, and he calls himself a slave of Jesus Christ in the first, in the opening sentence. So James got to really understand who Jesus was. Uh, he just didn't use the word hope. So we need to not only believe what the New Testament writers tell us, but we need to believe the Bible completely. We need to put our faith completely in the Bible that what is being told in us there is true. And then there's people who have a problem with that. And if you can't get past that, these other steps aren't going to help you. <clears throat> and it also says our citizenship is in heaven. We need to know where we really reside. Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So we need to understand that we don't live here. We're just passing through. James says we're a vapor. Our lives are a vapor. We're here today and gone tomorrow. Well, that's encouraging to me because I know at some point I'm going to end up in heaven. And the way God's time and his mind works, somehow we're already there based on the scriptures. But um, so if we realize that we don't belong here, we're citizens of heaven already, we have to understand that he has blessed us. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Every spiritual blessing, he has given us everything. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And through these spiritual blessings, he has equipped us with everything we need. And we see that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of him who called us by his glory and his virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of his divine nature, having overcome the corruption that is in this world because of people's lusts. He's telling us right here that God has given us these spiritual, these, these heavenly blessings that enable us to live a godly life. That's how they lead into each other. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, how we can live a godly life in this earthly realm that we hear for a short time. And because we've been given everything we need, we have no reason to worry. We have no reason to be angry. We have no right reason to be anxious. We have no reason to be depressed. We have no reason to fear. And that's because Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, be anxious for nothing. This is one of those commands that appears to be a suggestion. And I'll talk about this in a second. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything but by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I think this is one of those verses that people kind of just blow past. They're so familiar with it that it has become less powerful them, for them to tap into. And what I mean by that is, is we kind of just blow past it because, she's, okay, uh, if you're dealing with anxiety, don't be anxious for anything, everything, prayer, supplication, and God will take care of it. And that's, if you really look deeply into the passage, this is extremely powerful. It says here, a command. Because I've given you everything that you need to live a godly life, and you need to ask me about what you want, here's what's going to happen. I want you to be anxious for nothing. I want you to trust me. But in everything, those are two major contrasts. Be anxious for nothing, absolute nothing. 
but in everything. That means absolutely everything. By prayer and supplication, by asking for it. With thanksgiving, having a thankful heart for what you already have and what God has already given you. Make your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. It's going to guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, well, how's that going to happen? Let's look at the following verses in the same chapter. We can permit this peace of God to guard us by focusing on what the Scripture tells us. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, if you look at these qualities, these are all qualities of Jesus Christ himself. His attributes shine in this passage. He is true. He is noble. He is just. He is pure. He is lovely. He is of good report. And he is the only thing that is praiseworthy. There is no one else in scriptures that is worthy of our praise. It is Jesus Christ alone. Meditate on these things. So when we're going through rough times and we, we, we have these issues of anxiety and stuff, it says don't be anxious because you need to focus on Jesus. Focus on me. And I'll take it all away. And we need to look at how Jesus, we ask, Jesus, how would you handle this? How do you want me to handle this? And it's all in the scriptures here. And as we tap into Jesus and we have everything we need and he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing and we meditate on Jesus and we have this peace of God that just permeates our bodies and our minds and our thought process and our hearts we get to totally trust Jesus. It says we need to set our hope on Jesus Christ simply because we know that we can believe everything he told us. There's no reason Jesus is going to lie to us. He loves us. He loves us so much that he died for us. And he's saving our souls. So why would we think he's not going to tell us the truth on how to live our lives here on earth? So we could live without worry. We could live without fear. We could live without anxiety. If we choose to... to Listen to the words in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which is another passage that I think people just blow past because it's so familiar. It's trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Let's look at what this passage is saying to us. We talked about why we could trust in the Lord, so let's do it. Let's trust in the Lord with all your heart. God, Jesus wants all of our hearts. He wants everything, okay? There's no room here for mistrust. There's not room for 1% of saying, yeah, Jesus, I get it, but let's look at this other means of hope. That's not what it's saying here. It's saying trust in the Lord with all your heart. And the next uh, line is, is very important too because it says lean out on your own understanding. We're not that smart. We're not as brilliant as we think we are. You know, we put all of these posts on Facebook saying how the world could be fixed and how we can fix everything and this is the best way to do things or whatever. And uh, ultimately, all that does is cause somebody to argue back with you and you end up getting anxious and, and angry over all of that. So lean not on your own understanding. Trust the Lord. Get out of his way is what it's saying. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And, and how do we acknowledge God? You know, that's, that's a word there that, that really we just kind of blow past. Yeah, he's God. No, I want you to stop for a second and really focus. Think back in your life, whether it be a month ago, three months ago, six months ago, a year, two years, five years, ten years. It doesn't matter. Think back in your life about the times that God showed up when you needed him most. Think about the times where money may have been scarce. You couldn't pay a bill. Think about the times where food might have been a little lacking. And you weren't sure how you, you know, you weren't going to eat that night. Maybe you feed your kids, but you're going to go hungry or something. Think about the times you were ill, some kind of disease or, or something, where you were looking for healing. Think about maybe you were suicidal at one time. And you were ready to make a move. And somebody just happened to ring your phone or shoot you a text or or. or or provide a, 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 you know, knock on your door or something like that. And they just showed up. And that's God. That's God showing up. And we need to not acknowledge that. 
And when we acknowledge the fact that God has always showed up when we needed him most, we need to understand the fact that he's going to keep doing that. He's going to show up again and again and again. That is what it means to acknowledge God. And when we do this, he's going to direct our paths because we mess it up when we try to direct our own paths. We're not that smart, says line two. So we need to trust in God in all of this. We come to a point here where we're talking about trusting God completely. I went through a lot, of, a lot of scenarios today about where I think this country is and where I think it might be heading, and, and I hope I'm wrong. I really do. Um, I'm going to guess that some of this stuff will happen, maybe not all of it right away, but, you know, that's, that, that's the things I see potentially happening. And there's, there's a piece of scripture that, that jumped out at me, um, which I kind of identify with where we are right now as a country. And I'm talking about trusting in the Lord. And if we look at Habakkuk, Chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. Habakkuk is a prophet in the Old Testament. It's a very short book. It's three chapters. And Habakkuk, you know, right at this time, his people are being held captive. They're living under Assyrian rule. At this point, the Babylonians are about to come in and take over the Assyrians. So now they're going to be under another foreign invader's rule. And, you know, things are probably, you know, going right along under the Assyrians. People had their positions, their jobs or whatever. And now all of a sudden this new uh, regime is going to come in and pillage and pilfer everything around and destroy the land again and all of that. And the, the, the Jewish people are going to have to put up with this. And Habakkuk is looking at this, realizing this is going to happen. And he says this, there's no hope really here for him as far as physically. He says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. My question to you is, if the things that I mentioned today do come true, will you have the faith of Habakkuk? Will you trust the Lord even when things aren't going well, when things are going especially bad? Will you trust the Lord? I hope you will. I hope I will when it goes that, if it goes that bad. Folks, I want to switch gears a little bit here. I want to personalize this for a minute. Um, many of you know what's going on in my life at this point. Um, some of you don't, but, um, and some of you may know part of it. But 2020 was a year that my world got turned upside down. Mine and my wife's world got turned upside down. Um, start, the year started off like any other year. Had a job, family, health, um, house. I had a nice cabin in the woods freedom to travel to see my grandkids and my daughter and my son-in-law as much as I wanted for the most part. And then, you know, COVID comes around. We did some quick traveling before we got locked down or whatever. And then I got news in April that um, my job was going away. And I had a very good job, Um, very, very good job, very good boss, uh, paid well. And um, I got the news that it's going away. And I trusted that the Lord had his hand in this. And I wasn't rattled at all. And then a month later, my father passed away in early May. Um, we didn't get to see him like we did my mom a couple of years ago. Um, he, we basically got a phone call saying, your dad's not doing well. Then uh, from the assisted living where he was, they brought him to the hospital, said he's not doing well. And then a couple of days later, they said, your dad is gone. And a couple of days later, the, we heard your dad is cremated. You can pick up the ashes. Um, that was tough on us, but I trusted that the Lord had his hand in that also. And it was upsetting, but I didn't get rattled. I trusted God through that. And then, um, because of the, you know, job situation, my wife and I decided it was best to sell the house that we wouldn't be able to afford keeping the mortgage that we had and all of that. So we sold our house and, um, we also sold the cabin that we had. And along with that, we sold and got rid of a lot of possessions. Um, We sold some, and we gave away a lot, you know, and 
we, it was very freeing. <laughs> it really was very freeing just to get rid of a lot of stuff that I'm not responsible for anymore. And I trust that God had his hand in this also. And then um, in early June, at some point, I developed this cough that, that started. And it progressed through the summer. And um, ultimately, by the middle or the end of August, I was in the hospital having tubes stuck through my ribs while I was awake in a very uncomfortable procedure. And uh, they had to drain six liters of fluid off my lung, uh, cancerous fluid off my lung. And then a month later, they had to do very much the same procedure while I was awake, very painful again. And um, ultimately, that hospital stay, they put, in, they, they put a fix into my lung, basically, to stop the fluids from coming in. And um, they fixed the lung. Um, and then when I went to meet my oncologist a few days later, uh, he told me that I had stage four metastatic gallbladder cancer. And again, I wasn't rattled. I wasn't rattled. Um, of course, nobody wants to hear that news, but I was not rattled. And through this whole thing, through this whole process of, of losing my job all the way up to telling me I have a deadly disease, um, I was, I was almost giggling at times because I watched the Lord show up over and over and over again. When I needed help getting people to move me and all of that stuff, men, from, men and women from this church showed up, my brothers, my family, friends, my relatives. It was just amazing to watch God's hand in all of this. And, and, and it, was, it, was, it, was, it was an honor to realize that God was, was, was taking care of me. And my doctor told me that I have a, you know, the disease that, uh, cancer that is incurable, at this time, and um, he's going to, you know, begin treatments and all of that stuff. And I just trusted in God through the whole thing. And the first thing I did the day that he told me that was I went home and I went into the Bible. And I recall a story of um, Hezekiah. I believe it's in First King, uh, Second Kings chapter 20 or 23, somewhere around there. And he talks about... Um, the, 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 um, Isaiah the prophet is told by God to tell Hezekiah the king that he's going to die today. And Hezekiah weeps and he turns to the wall and he prays to God for more time. And Isaiah is leaving and God grabs him and says, okay, listen, go back and tell Hezekiah I'm going to give him 15 more years. And that's what I did. I said, Lord, <laughs> if you can give me 15 more years, I'll be very happy with that. Now, I don't know if God's going to give me 15 years or 15 days or 30 years. I don't know. But I, I went to him because no doctor is going to change God's plan for my life. I firmly believe that. I believe that, the God, that God provided this doctor for me because we prayed for something along these lines, and he gave us exactly what we prayed for. But when I prayed that prayer, I was just comforted by it, realizing that it's in God's hands, it's out of the doctor's hands, and it's out of my hands, and there's no human being that's going to be able to fix me. And I need to just put my trust in God. And if God took me tomorrow, I'd be fine with that, because I'm going to be with him in glory. I'm not afraid to die. What I'm fearful of is how my family's going to have to deal with that. That's the part that's upsetting to me. You know, I've got, a, I got amazing brothers. I've got aunts and uncles that love me. My, my wife, obviously, my daughter, my son-in-law, and I've got four grandkids that, you know, I'm one awesome pop-pop, <laughs> and I don't want them to miss out on that in, in their lifetimes, and I pray to God not to take me from them, and, and we'll see what God has in store for, for that. But as I talk about that, you know, people said to me, Mark, how do you have this faith? How do you have this faith like Paul and like Peter? And, and I certainly don't put myself on that level. I really don't, um, but some of you are. And, and my answer is easy. I have no other choice. I have to trust God because I've been saying all along for the last eight or nine years since I've known the Lord, I trust him. Well, now that I'm going through things like this, how can I not? How can I not live that out? And God just continues to show up. And my challenge to you this year I'm going to issue a, you a challenge for 2021. If you want to have an awesome 2021, I want you to trust the Lord. I want you to get to know him. I want you to cultivate your relationship with the Lord in 2021. 
if you go on Facebook and you have issues with people, what they post, and you, it makes you angry, and you have issues with ranting and raving all over Facebook and letting your feelings out all over Facebook, delete your account. I challenge you, delete your account. If you watch the news and you walk away angry and you're yelling at the TV, throw your TV out. Give it away. I challenge you. And the time that you would normally spend watching TV, getting angry at the news, or getting upset on Facebook, use that to get to know the Lord. You know, the Lord says, uh, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. He's talking about radical amputation there. The things that are separating you from him, from living a life that you can have in 2021, if you trust him completely and get out of your own way, get out of his way. He's saying, get those things out of your life and come to me. So 2021, I'm challenging you to spend the time with the Lord. Cultivate your relationship with him. Get to know who he really is. Get to know why you can trust him. And you'll have an awesome 2021. And if you don't know where to begin in the Bible, and if you say you don't have time, make time. Make time. If you have time for Facebook and TV, you have time to put that away and spend it with the Lord in the scriptures. And if you don't know where to begin, talk to me, talk to Pastor Dave. I would urge you even just to the book of Ephesians. Spend the next year in the book of Ephesians. The first three chapters tell you what God has blessed you with, who your position in God because of what Christ did for you. And there's a couple of prayers by Paul that, that he basically is, is praying to God that you would understand all of these blessings. And then the following three chapters talk about how you're supposed to live your life because of who you are in Christ. I pray that you would take this challenge. Finally, folks, um, there's been so many of you. I just want to thank you. Uh, my wife and I, we've been amazingly blessed by all of you this year with what we've gone through. We couldn't have gone through it without you. And you are the children of God. You are Christ's children, and you exemplify that with the love of Christ this year. We've, we've received food, uh, blessings, cards, uh, finances, um, encouragement, texts, phone calls, visits, all of these things that just encouraged us through the year uh, that we had. And it was really just the love of Christ pouring out of all of you. And we can't thank you enough for that. And um, we just ask for your continued prayers. That's really all we need at this point. And thank you for everything. And as we close, I want to close with a prayer that I'm going to borrow from Paul from Ephesians. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that I pray that what God revealed to me today and shared with you today, that you would really understand it and put it into practice and make it part of your life. He says in chapter one, therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. May God bless you and thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.